You ever thought you got away with a crime and then they come up with this pesky thing called the DNA? Well, that's what happened with Walter E. Ellis, and that's what we're going to go over today. We here at Angry Me Production want to thank our sponsor, Mobile Notary Mindy. She's certified with the National Notary Association. She's also bonded and E&O insured. She offers a wide range of services, including wills, powers of attorney, medical documents, health care proxies, living wills, certification of trust, assignment of personal property, HIPAA waivers, advanced health care directives, and 99 verification. You can find her on Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram at Mobile Notary Mindy. You can also visit her webpage at TexasMobileNotaryMindy.com. That's TX MobileNotaryMindy.com. Thank you so much and enjoy the show. Ladies and gentlemen of all ages, boys and girls, thank you for tuning in to yet another episode of Angry Me Production. We appreciate you coming in and letting us be a part of your lives week in and week out. We hope to do our best to present you with something that your eardrums delight in. Whether you're looking at us on YouTube or Rumble, or listening to us on Spotify, Google, or Anchor, or any of the other podcast services that we are currently on or trying to get on, we thank you. And if you don't mind, at the end of every episode, Stop by, leave us a comment, leave us a like. If it asks for five stars, we'll take five stars, even if you don't like us. Five stars are what it's all about. With that being said, we hope you enjoy our attempt to make our advocation our vocation. Ladies and gentlemen, let the games begin. Welcome. Angry Babel. Yes, uh, this is actually a weird case because he almost got away with it. Uh, Walter E. Ellis, uh, if it wasn't for DNA, and we'll get into the uh, tidbits on that, uh, if it wasn't for the fact that uh, they got his DNA, he would have gotten away with all the uh, murders that he did. So, let us begin. Walter E. Ellis was born June 24, 1960 and Holmes County, Mississippi, as one of six children to Leroy and Maddie Ellis. In the mid-1960s, the family left Mississippi and resettled in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Beginning in early childhood, Ellis showed signs of antisocial behavior, acting impulsively and aggressive towards his peers, frequently assaulting classmates and neighboring children. For this, he was earned a reputation as a local bully and frequently disciplined. After the eighth grade, he dropped out of school in 1974 due to poor academic performance, chronic abs, abs, chronic absentees. Sorry, my dyslexia kept it kicked in right there, and I was trying to pronounce it uh, during uh, turning a life of crime, a criminal history of Ellis. Uh, at age 14, he was arrested for the first time for robbery and attempted murder. However, he was let go on a large fine as a minor in the following four years. He was arrested twice uh, for more theft and only an order, uh, order to pay a fine. But in November 1978, he was uh, arrested for robbery. He pleaded guilty and was given four years of probation. Jeez. Okay. I'm I'm sorry. Sometimes the judicial uh, system is kind of was lacking in the 70s. In May 1979, Ellis was arrested for possessing drugs, but during the investigation, he was able to prove that the drugs had been uh, sold to him by a pharmacy without a prescription. So he again just only paid a fine. A year later, in May 1980, while trying to become a pimp. I like how they said it was like while trying to become a pimp. 
Uh, he got into a fight with a local hustler and prostitutes for which he was arrested and charged with extortion, but later was released due to lack of evidence. Over the next four years, he was repeatedly um, been indi indicted, indicted for various other offenses for which he was either given probation or parole. In February 1985, when he was released from prison, Ellis attempted to find an honest job working as a day laborer in addition to taking odd jobs, but was charged with extortion by, the, uh, by, by September. The charges were uh, later dropped when it was learned that the woman was a prostitute, ruining her, uh, ruining her, her credibility and resulting in Ellis' release. On October 18th, 1986, Ellis was arrested for disturbing in uh, public order, uh, disturbing of the peace. During his arrest, he was attacked. Uh, he attacked the police officer. For this, he was ordered to spend seven months in county jail. In May 1987, almost immediately after his release, he was rearrested for theft and sent back to prison for a year. However, he was released on parole after nine months. In November 1988, he was caught in an attempt of carjacking, uh, during which he was uh, harmed. He harmed the arresting officer. Which uh, uh, to get on this real quick. Uh, when working in a correctional officer, any time an inmate touches you, it is uh, considered a, a harmful touch. I mean, yes, it's ridiculous, and if you want to get extra charges, you can get extra charges for that. And it does happen a lot. And if you're thinking, oh, that, that's ridiculous. Why would you do that? To uh, You want to keep a certain distance between uh, inmate and officers uh, when working corrections because they could come up to you and stab you. But for this sentence, uh, for uh, this sentence, he was sentenced for two years for violating his parole. When he was released on January 9, 1990, Ellis joined a drug trafficking ring, the Brothers of Struggle. Okay, that's an interesting name. Who frequently engaged in rivalry with other gangs based in Milwaukee. In June, he was arrested for disturbing, uh, distributing drugs and convicted in November 1990 of the charges. By this point, uh, due to his uh, excessive rap sheet, which included several uh, federal violations, Ellis was ordered to serve his sentence in federal prison in uh, Minnesota. In May 1992, he was released yet again, but in November of that year, he was back behind bars for violating the conditions of his parole. Because of this, he was ordered to uh, enter a rehab program. At the halfway house, prisoners were allowed various liberties, such as having a job, study, uh, studying, or attending church, but uh, were also frequently allowed to leave uh, after bribing officials. And yes, that happens. I think Tansy talked about that on when I was on his podcast. Uh, in December 1992, Ellis was arrested for leaving the premises without permission, but was uh, freed from any punishment after informing the uh, uh, authorities about a rampant corruption. Because of this, he was hired as a police informant for several years. And if you look at Waddy Bulger, if you get paid as an informant they let you slide on a lot of stuff which is ridiculous to me uh over the following years ellis repeated violations conditions of his parole but avoided criminal liability each time due to his status as an informant between 1994 and 1995 he was repeatedly uh arrested for assaulting his girlfriend injuring one of uh, them with a screwdriver in december 1997 he was arrested for attempting robbery during which he assaulted the assaulting uh, arresting officer, but was only sentenced to five and a half years of probation over the next few months. However, he committed several uh, additional offenses, such as resulting in its uh, its uh, collision of an in informant uh, with police ceasing any and all contacts with him. In August 1998, he was sentenced to three years in imprisonment for reckless endangerment, which he was served in on a Scotia Correctional Institute. I am surprised, as everybody else, 
I was able to pronounce that. Uh, in July 2001, that was re uh, released and returned to, um, I can't even say released, but I can say on a Scotia. Uh, put in the comments how much you hate me for reading because it's ridiculous at times. Where he spent the next few years earning money as a low lab uh, low skill laborer. Uh, low skill laborer is a person that just uh, they basically handyman. He can use a measuring tape. He can use a saw. He can build a house. Uh, all those excessive things and nothing against uh, low skill laborers. Uh, they build houses. They they keep us running. The uh, plumbers considered low skill labor. Uh, I don't know if electrician or anybody else because you have to have like a degree of reading, but a lot of those low I appreciate low skill labors. I'm telling you that right now. Cause if you don't want to do something, you have somebody to go in and uh, fix your stuff. But anyways, I digress. Now in May, 2009, while reexamining the cold case murders of seven prostitutes between the ages of 19 and 41, the Milwaukee police learned via a DNA analysis that all of the killings were committed by a singular perpetrator. A statewide investigation eventually discovered that Justice Department was missing saliva and blood samples from inmate Walter E. Ellis, which were apparently lost on the way to a for, uh, forensics lab. At late August, Ellis was ordered to give a sample as a Law Institute in 2001 declared that uh, all convicts criminals have to be given uh, have to give DNA samples, which um, they have my DNA samples because I was in the military. But anyways, uh, there that law actually uh, helped a lot of case, cold cases because they figured out who did it, and it actually set a lot of people free because they realized they had the wrong person. Now. After he failed to appear at the police station, uh, an arrest warrant was issued for Ellis while police entered and examined his apartment. A toothbrush containing traces of saliva uh, was confiscated and examined within a few days. Ellis's DNA was a match to the murders of nine women in a three-mile area of northern Milwaukee spanning from 1986 to 2007. Shortly after his arrest warrant was issued, Ellis's car, a maroon 1994 Buick Century, was spotted in town of uh, Franklin on September uh, 7, 2009. He was located in one of the city's motels where he was staying with his 54-year-old girlfriend, Teresa Johnson, who was not from Milwaukee and was unaware of what he was doing. He was also holding her against her will, which is why she was with him when he was apprehended. At the time of his arrest, police seized a small uh, quantity of crack cocaine and a crack pipe. Following his arrest, Ellis was charged with the murders of seven women, 31-year-old Deborah Lee Harris, uh, strangled and dumped in the river on October 10th, 1986, 19-year-old Tanya L. Miller, Strangled on October 11th, 1986. And 25-year-old Irene Smith strangled November 8th, 1992. 28-year-old uh, Florence McCarlick found strangled in April 24th, 1995. 37-year-old uh, Celia Farrow, uh, whose body was discovered in June 27th, 1995. 41 Joyce and Mims, uh, who was found strangled uh, June 20th, 1996. 28-year-old Orthorina C. Strokes, whose body was found April 27th, 19, uh, 20, 2007. In addition to these killings, Ellis suspected uh, in killing a 32-year-old Karen uh, D. Kipnek. On October 13th, 1994, Curtis McCoy had been charged with her murder, but was later uh, acquitted to uh, at a jury trial. Aside from uh, from her, he was also the suspect of a murder of 16-year-old Jessica Pine on August 30th, 1995. Unlike the other victims who had died from blood loss due to a slash on the throat, 
uh, the discrepancy caused the perpetrator uh, prosecutor to not press charges against Ellis, realizing that he might have uh, only just a sexually assaulted her. Following Ellis's arrest, Dub uh, began to arise over the conviction of uh, Charlotte Dean Oti, who was initially convicted of uh, Pine's murder in 1996 uh, based solely on the witness testimony after spending 14 years in prison. And all charges against him were dropped and he was released in 2009. See, told you, sometimes just DNA evidence helps out. Uh, similarly, in May 2010, Ellis's DNA was matched to a 1998 murder of Mary Etha Griffin, from which William Avery had been convicted in 2005. After his uh, revelation, uh, Avery was ex uh, extorted and released, and his case was to sort a uh, mis uh, miscarriage of justice. After he was charged, Ellis initially pleaded not guilty with his trial scheduled began in April 2011. In February of that year, however, after consulting with his lawyer, ex uh, Ellis accepted a plea agreement by the prosecutor's office, admitting his guilt, petitioning for a sentence without trial. This was accept uh, accepted by the prosecutors and the victims of the family. On February 24, 2011, Ellis was sentenced to seven consecutive life sentences without the chance of parole. After his uh, conviction, Ellis was tra uh, transferred to serve his, uh, serve his sentence at Dakota State Penitentiary in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, following the agreement between the two states. Shortly after his uh, arrival in prison, he, uh, his health began to de deteriorate, and he was transferred to a prison hospital where he was diagnosed with diabetes. On uh, December 1st, 2013, Ellis passed away due to complications with his diabetes at the age of 53. Really? He died of diabetes? I mean, wow. That's, that, that, that's weird. and It's very weird that he, I figured, because I was looking at it and I saw the death was like at 53. I thought that he got executed or he committed suicide. Uh, uh, self affliction of death will do that it's longer. And I hate the algorithms, anyways. Uh, yeah, that, that he died of diabetes that's the strange thing for me on that one, but uh, yeah, anyways. Uh, DNA helps, uh, helps a lot of cases that uh, has been going through. Uh, a lot of the cases nowadays. Uh, you had to give a DNA swab, and most of the time, the DNA is the person that they caught half the time. So, but anyways, thank you all. Thank you all for listening. Thank you all for watching, and goodbye.